So last week, uh, we were in this sermon series called Breakthrough. Last week was our first week, and uh, I posed the question before I even talked. I, I asked, how many of you have control issues? I have another question, and you're like, oh boy, here we go. Just a real quick question, it has nothing to do with my sermon, but I want to know. So it's my own personal it's for my own personal uh, benefit. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know what a locking lug nut is. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, now, in all honesty, raise your hand if you have never heard or don't know what a locking lug nut is. I am preaching to about five, the rest of you are dismissed. <laughs> Thank the good Lord, some hands came up. But let me tell you about yesterday real quick before we go into the sermon. Um, we go to the beach, and Crystal looks at me and said, hey, you're getting a little red. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Well, it turns out I'm not fine. That's why I'm wearing a loose shirt, because I have things going on everywhere that uh, are very uncomfortable right now. So... Hopefully I can keep this sermon short. And you're like, amen, praise God. But, um, we're walking home, and she looks and she says, we have a flat tire. And my initial reaction was, Lord, you had given, when, when I'm in the ocean, that's where I feel like the Lord gives me inspiration, where he wants me to go in the sermon. So I go out there and float. And I have these things that I need to get them out on paper. I gotta do a brain dump, get them out. And that was my mindset. I gotta get it out. We look at the flat tire, and I was like, I really can't do this right now. I'm gonna go upstairs for about an hour. And I get a text message from my wife saying, FYI, Alan has a uh, air compressor. And I ask, Is it okay if you handle this? I'll be up here for about an hour. <laughs> Come downstairs. My wife says. Oh yeah, Alan's waiting on you. Just he was waiting for you to be done, and then you'll handle it. And I was like, oh man, I truly wish that it was just taken <laughs> care of by the time I was done. I got the air compressor, filled it up, and I don't know how big this gash is or this puncture. So I fill it up and I said, you know what? I'm gonna roll the dice. I'm gonna I'm gonna drive to Walmart and I'm gonna check the air pressure. Our gauge will say the air pressure, and I'm gonna watch it. And my prayer life shot through the roof as I was driving over that bridge. I was like, Lord Jesus, please, please do not let me have to change this tire when I get on the bridge. This is not going to be good. I get off the bridge, okay, I'm starting to relax. I go up in front of you guys, are like, where is this guy going? Just take it easy for a minute. I go in front of this, this young lady at the automotive center, and she says, this question, do you, it, do your tires, do they happen to have a locking bug nut? And I looked at her and I said, excuse me? <laughs> I said, uh, there's one that has like a little star on it, which I thought was cool in relation to the vehicle. And she said, sir, that's a locking bug nut. And I said, well, where can I get one of them? Do you sell them here? She goes, no, it came with your vehicle. So I go out in the vehicle, and I'm tearing it apart. I'm looking where the jack is. I know where the jack is. I know how to replace a tire. It doesn't have this special, specialized tool. So I'm looking through the glove box, because she comes out and sees my panic and says, um, I want you to relax a little bit. We don't want to go through your stuff, but just relax. We have plenty of time. We see that there's a little bit of chaos. Relax a little bit. Once you find that, then we can get your tire fixed. Couldn't find it, so I called, literally called my, my mechanic. Answered the phone, I said, hey, Crystal. <laughs> True story. Hey, Crystal. First question. Do you know what a locking, locking lug nut is? She said, yes, ma'am. I said, then the second question, do you happen to know where it would be in our vehicle? And she's, 
pointed me to the exact direction of where that locking the lug nut is. Praise God. Thank you so much. But all this to say, I'm sitting in Walmart and I get a text from a good buddy. And he says, not even 15 minutes of me checking in the vehicle, I get a text saying, Hey, Pastor, a lot of people love you. If you ever need help finding a locking lug nut or changing the tire, <laughs> let us know. And I said, somebody told on me. Somebody told on me. But anyways, if there's a star on your lug nut, apparently you need a tool for that. Now I know. It was in the middle console at the bottom of all of the junk that... But, but here's the thing. I've used her as sermon examples for so many times. She owed me one on that one. So, so I don't mind that. Oh, we got one flat from this one back. One flat from this one back. Anyways, welcome on to church. I also want to uh, welcome our online viewers. Do you know that within the past week, our church family has blown up to a point where we now have, and I want to welcome these new countries, Germany, Kenya, Poland, Vietnam, Trinidad, and Tobago. So, we want to thank them. We are now, it's amazing how God can work. We, we now are reaching 20 different countries around the world with the name of Jesus, um, just by some schmuck with a microphone and a camera, preaching just Jesus, that's it. So, I love that, and I love that you're watching, and thank you for reaching out and letting us know that you're watching, but breakthrough. You're like, finally, man, there, is, is the sermon done yet? Nope, not even close. So breakthrough, what we are trying to endeavor in, and yesterday when I was doing notes, I just shut my laptop and I said, all right, God, this story is so powerful on its own. I just want to read through it, and I want you to be able to speak through me and allow me to get out of the way. I don't want any part of this. Shut my laptop and then fix the tire. Everything was great. But this story of breakthrough, and what we're talking about is a breaking of you to allow God to break through in your life. So last week we talked about breaking through control and how you get into your fortified place where it's just you and God. You turn your back on the crowd. You turn your back on all the voices that that are in your ear, even your own inner monologue, and you get in that fortified place with God, and you ask the question, Lord, should I? And I don't know about you, but I had many moments this week where that phrase popped up in my head, of, Lord, should I? Lord, should I? Lord, should I? And we're going to this um, story in 1 Kings, but we won't get to it yet. But this is such a magical breakthrough. As I read this over and over and over again this week, it reminded me of a story of when I first gave my life to Jesus and I was working age back. And I read this story of Elijah and what he did and the power of God through him and the breaking through into the people of Israel. And I was on fire for Jesus. It was just pouring out of me where I was like, I want to tell everyone about Jesus. If Elijah can do this, I can do this. If, God, if, if Elijah can ask for a miracle and something so miraculous happens, just by him calling out in the name of the Lord, then I want to be able to do that. So I'm in my van and I'm, I'm reading this before my first service call. And then I go into my first service call. And there's this gentleman there. And how many of you guys love this when? And if you are one of these people, stop. Okay? When you have a repairman in your house or someone doing something for you that you have hired, if you're standing over them like this, watching them do their work, man, that can be annoying. So I, I have this. There's some eight men is from the bag, but I see it. But I have this gentleman, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting before his heater that's in the closet, and it's not producing heat. The flame isn't lighting. 
And all of a sudden, he comes behind me and he looks at the tattoo that I have on the back of my arm. And he said, you're not one of those guys, are you? Because what my tattoo means is warrior for Christ. And then it has the Alpha and Omega sign. And I said, what do you mean one of those guys? And he said, you know, those Jesus freaks. And I said, well, yeah, if you want to call me that, that's what I am. I, I, claim, I claim the name of Jesus and I'm not ashamed of it. And then I said, in her monologue, I can't figure out what is wrong with this furnace. I'm going to sit here for a minute and pray that all of a sudden it lights and it's going to show this guy the power of God. <laughs> True story. I start praying over this furnace. And then I go in my van and I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, at least give me like the direction of where you want me to go. The, uh, the whatever part is bad in this, because I've tried and gone through every diagnostic that, that is possible with this. And the guy's just sitting there. And he even called me out on it. He's like, are you sleeping? I said, no, no, I'm praying. There's going to be fire. Just wait. There's going to be fire. <laughs> Go out to my bed, pray some more, come back in. Guess what happens? No fire. <laughs> I end up leaving at his request. I guess I was praying too long in his home. He ended up having to get a whole new system, new system. And then he asked that I never come back to his home. Now that brings us to Elijah. So before we're, we get into this story, I want to give you a little backdrop. You have King Ahab, his wife Jezebel. They are both wicked, wicked people. They are killing off God's people. The Bible even says that at, at one point, that King Ahab sold himself to sin. And it says that Jezebel was just as bad. That she was evil just like her husband, King Ahab. We don't have any Jezebels in here, right? Okay. <laughs> that name is falling off the map. Weird. But anyways, they, uh, they are going around killing people so much so that there are, there's this guy, Obadiah, that his head... The Lord's prophets in caves, two different caves. He's hid them and he's brought them food and water so they don't get killed. And then we go to this story. Elijah is walking around by himself. And in every country that, that King Ahab thinks that Elijah is in, he goes there. And if he's not there, he kills the person who says that Elijah was there. So this is where we're at. Ahab wants to kill Elijah. What does Elijah do? He says, hey... Call a meeting. Call a meeting. And it brings us to 1 Kings 18, if you're online, follow me. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Do you hear this? Israel was God's people. He, he performed all of these miracles brought him out of slavery, and then he's saying, you the one that is leading them to the one true God, you're the troubler of them. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. Okay. Look at the boldness of this one man. This boldness of a, of a king that he knows can cut his head off at any time. He says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and, and followed the Baals. You remember the Baals? We talked about it last week, the false prophet. So he calls for an old time showdown. You remember that? The old west? You, you meet in the middle of the road? He calls us. He says, summon, uh, summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat in, at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout, throughout all Israel, all Israel, all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. I, Elijah, went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? 
If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And I'm, we're going to stay here on this slide. Because these next words are so powerful. But the people said nothing. Here's my point. First point for breakthrough in your life. And Holy Spirit guide me as I say this. Are you, are you willing to stand if you're the only one standing? You have one man of God against 450 people who worship idols, false gods, who are doing worldly things. And what do we tend to, let's bring it into 2023. You know what? This whole crowd is getting bigger and bigger and bigger on what's right has now become wrong and what's wrong has now become right. And I'm kind of stuck in the middle. It says they wavered between two opinions. It says, how long, how long we waver between two opinions? And I want to ask you, are you willing to stand for the name of God if you are the only one standing? Because we can go out into this world on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, and we can see the people who are worshiping Baals, who are worshiping idols, who are worshiping things of this world, who are going against the word of God. And we can see a whole country that is now changing. And I want to ask you, are you willing to stand on God's word, even if you're the only one in the crowd standing on God's word. You want to see a breakthrough? A breakthrough doesn't happen when you join the crowd and say everything is fine. And then you move back on a Sunday morning and say, now I'm going to worship the Lord. That's what they were doing. There, there were some days where they would follow God and follow his word. And then other days they would move and they would listen to the false prophets and bow down to idols made of statues. How long, church, will you hesitate between two opinions? How long? Either this is truth or the world is true. But I want to ask, will you pick? Will you stand on your beliefs? Will you stand what is firm even when it is not popular? Because I fully believe we are moving into a time we are already starting. We are moving into a time where the things that I preach will not be allowed five, ten years from now. It could be considered hate speech. It could be considered, no, we're, we're going to shut you down because you don't believe in the things that we're, we're trying to implement into this country. And I want to stand here as your pastor and say, if I'm the only one standing, I will still stand on this word of God. I don't care what happens. I don't care where the world goes. As long as God is saying, I am the, I am the God that saved you, that I shed my blood for you, are you going to stand even if you're the only one standing? You want to see breakthrough happen? You get into that mindset of saying, I don't want to watch the news. I'm not, I'm not looking at, at what the world is doing. I want to look at what God is doing, and I'm going to stand on that, and I'm going to shut out all the other things. But how long will you hesitate between two opinions? They hesitated between two opinions. And I want to ask, some of you need to make a decision today. How, where will you stand? Will it be a Sunday morning? And I'm not angry at you. I want you to know this. I'm like, love Jesus and I'm passionate. Some people will mistake that as anger. No, I'm passionate about Jesus and what he's done for my life. But I want to know, will you make a decision? What will you choose? Because choosing Jesus when it's against 450 people who are against you and at any moment are allowed to kill you. And he stands firm and makes a choice and says, I will serve the Lord and Lord alone. 
But I want to say, make a choice. Make a choice. We waver, don't we? Sunday mornings, it's easy to look around and say, yeah, yeah, I follow the Lord. I follow the Lord. Well, what about Monday? What are you worshiping on Tuesday? What are you worshiping on, the, on Friday night? Let's go there. And he's saying, make a decision. Choose. Choose. And I want to make this very clear, church. If you think the price of choosing is too high, that it may cost you some friends, it may cost you some popularity, it may cost you some fame, it may cost you relationships. If you think the, cup, the price of choosing is too high, wait until you get the bill of regret. And that bill is eternal. So the first point is, are you willing to stand even if you're standing alone. It says the people said nothing. And I want to let you know I have been there many, many times in my life where I've been around a group of friends, where I've been around this, this just a bunch of people who are saying one thing and in my heart it's saying this is not right and what did I do? I said nothing. I remained quiet. Why? Because I was like, what would they think of me? Are they going to kick me out of their group? Is everything going to be okay in our relationship? If I stand on the word of God, but it said the people said nothing. Now let's move on with this story. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one, the only one of the Lord's prophets left. I'm the only one left. And I'm standing here before you. But Baal has 450 prophets. So he says, you know what? Let's make a demonstration, a divine demonstration. Go get two bowls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and I'll put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. That's the only, that's the only deal right there is you, you, can, you can pick the bowl, you can pick the wood. You can pick how you put it on there. But the one thing you cannot do is you cannot put fire to it. No spark, nothing. There's nothing that can go under this. Then you, he's saying to the 450, then you call on the name of your God. And I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire. He is God. You, you see how in my HVAC story, I was like, I'm bringing fire to this furnace. Do you call on fire? I'm going to fire down to this furnace. Didn't happen. But it says, Then you call on the name of the Lord. I will call the name of your God. I will call the name of the Lord. God who answers by fire. He is God. Then, then the people start talking. Weird, right? First they said nothing. When he challenged them, saying, Are you going to choose the Lord? Or are you going to choose to consider uh, uh, to worship these Worldly idols that do nothing for you make a decision. They said nothing. They were quiet. It was, no, I'm not taking a stand. I'm not taking a stand because this guy can kill me. Uh, and I'm not sure about this guy, but so I'm going to be stuck. I'm going to hesitate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in the middle. But now, now they open their mouth. And they, then all, all the people, all of them said, well, yeah, okay. What you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bowls and prepare it first. I love this. this. When, when I get to heaven, I don't know if this is how heaven works. I have no, no reason. I've, I've done research, but I, I really hope when I get to heaven that we can sit with certain people. Because this is my guy right here. He's like, you know what? This condescending, specifically, um, passive aggressive you know what there's so many of you why don't you just go first well I'll let you go first there's so many of you just just go on go on call on call on the name of your God once again don't light the fire so they took the bowl given them and prepared it then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon 
morning till noon, they are calling on God, to, to their God, to light this. They're saying, please, please, please. Baal, answer us. They shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, this is why I love them. Because I've, I've been called a troll at times. And I'll take it. I love it. This is where Elijah gets into the troll mode. He sat back after watching from morning till noon of them shouting to a false god saying, answer us, answer us. But no one listened, no one replied. So Elijah walks up. He says, hey, shout louder. Surely he is God. Perhaps he's in deep thought. Maybe he's busy. Or maybe he went on vacation. Maybe he's traveling. Or maybe... Maybe he's asleep and you got to wake him up. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed out. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for evening sacrifice. But there was, once again, there was no response. No one answered. And no one paid attention. Look at Psalms 115 for a minute. This is what idols are. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak. No one answered. When they call on Baal, no one answered. Eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. They have noses but cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. They have feet, but can't walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. And here's where we get to 2023. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. I want to ask you, what's your identity in? When people look at you, what do they see? If people were to see you, and, and I was to ask, describe this person to me, what do they look like? What are their emotions? What are their beliefs? Would Jesus be one of the top ones? I really hope that for, my, for myself personally. Where somewhere on my tombstone, I wanted to say this was a man who loved and believed in Jesus. I honestly do. I want people to know me as the guy who knows Jesus. But I want to ask what your identity is in. And if you don't know what, what it's in, think of something that you love right now. Think of something that you love. Love to do. Love to put your time and energy into. You just love everything about it. And let me ask you a question. If God takes it from you tomorrow, are you okay with it? If God takes it from you tomorrow, took it all away, are you okay with it? If not, you found identity in it. You found your identity in it. And if you have identity in it, it's become your idol because you start to look like what you worship. You will look like what you worship. If you worship Jesus, you will start to shine the light of Jesus in your life to everyone around you. If you're serving the gods of this world, those things that will only damage you. Look at what happened with the, the people who cried out to Baal. They started damaging themselves. They were cutting themselves. Now reverse the story. And they were those people were reading a book about us in 2023. How many of us are damaging ourselves 
because the things that will not speak, will not relate to us, will not answer us, will not fulfill us, will not do anything for us, yet we're just damaging ourselves. Do you think, because if we look at that story and we say, that's crazy, why would you slash yourself and blood gush it on the altar? This is really, really weird. Let's flip it. How many of us are damaging ourselves in sin today? Bowing down to things that will never fulfill us. That will never shine light into us. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how God would call the Israelites stiff-necked people a lot? You heard that, right? Stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked people. What's, what's stiff-necked? Excuse me. <clears throat> Puberty is hard. We'll go down that day. <laughs> What is what's stiff necked? The idols they worshiped. God is saying, You're starting to look like the idols that you worship. You stiff necked, stubborn people. They damaged themselves for an idol that wouldn't answer. Do you know what's crazy is they forgot about the God that brought them out of slavery, the God that had a cloud to lead them and fire to lead them and brought manna from heaven to feed them and parted the Red Sea, who did all of these miracles, and then all of a sudden this, this wicked king comes in and they're like, um, yeah, that, that this worldly thing, okay, yeah, but when, when, when the crown's around, when people are paying attention, I'll bow down to this just because I, I really want to fit in. I'm going to fit in. But, but you know, God, I, know, I still know you're here, but, but I, I have to come over here at times and, and I have to bow down to this false God. And we do this. I do this. We bow down to our career. We bow down to our money. We bow down to our addiction. We bow down to our fame. We bow down for our stuff. And you know what I did for a couple of years? I bowed down to the idol of ministry. And people are like, what, what, what is, that, that doesn't go together, man. You want, you want to know how it went together? It is every single day, I was out ministering to other people and I was adding Bible study after Bible study after Bible study and I was counseling until late in the night and I would wake up early morning and I was counseling early in the morning and my whole day was filled with ministry while my family was left in the dust. My very first ministry was left in the dust and my wife said, when are you going to have time for us? And I realized at that moment that I had bowed down to the things that I thought brought me closer to God. Where I had to impress God. By look at all the things that I, I'm doing. And I want to I ask you, are you in that phase right now where I, I really can, because point number two is boldness will bring your breakthrough. Boldness will bring your breakthrough. I was bowing down to things that, that did nothing for me. Did nothing for me. And all of a sudden my wife said, you're leaving us behind. And I had a breakthrough in that moment. And Lord, I just had a thought. Bring it back to me because I'm, I think it was a good one. We bow down to different things. It'll come to me. It'll come to me. Oh, okay. Impressing, impressing God. That was my idol. I'm going to impress God. I'm going to impress God by my works. I'm going to impress God by my Bible reading. I'm going to impress God by the, the amount of times I highlight my Bible. And if you're one of those people that say, look at how spiritual I am. Look at how highlighted my Bible is. That doesn't mean you're spiritual. That just means that you got an A in, in kindergarten because you colored within the lines. Okay, it means nothing. 
If you want the highway, good for you. But if you think that makes you more spiritual, you're, you're, you're off of it. But if we do all these things to impress God. When I want to ask you, instead of trying to impress God, why don't you press into Him? Why don't you just press into Him? Because boldness will bring your breakthrough. Let's go back to the story. What happens with His boldness? In 1 Kings 18. Then Elijah said to all the people, come on, you know what, you're bleeding, get some band-aids. When you, you cut yourself, there's blood everywhere, get cleaned up, come to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. So throughout the years of this wicked king, all the altars of the Lord were, turned, were torn down because we're going to worship a false god. And Elijah took 12 stones. I can just imagine 450 of them just watching him. I'm going to repair this. I'm going to get 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the, stone, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Quick pause. What is your life in the name of. I want that to settle. What is your life in the name of? Is it in the name of Jesus? My life is in the name of Jesus. I find my identity in him. Or is your life in the name of wealth, popularity, fame? What is your life in the name of? He's saying this will be in the name of the Lord. And he dug a trench. This was something new. Never done it before. This was something new. They're, they're thinking, what is he doing? He rebuilt the altar. We've seen the altar before. But now he's digging a trench around it. What, what's going on? This must be a magic trick. It must be a magic trick. This is where he tricked us. We didn't dig a trench. We just cut ourselves and blood all over then he dug out the trench around large enough to hold two saves of seed, which is about 24 pounds of seeds for all the nerds out there. Okay, that's what that is. He arranged the wood. He arranged it up. He cut the bowl into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to him, okay, you want to know how great my God is? And how there's no tricks involved with this? I want you to fill four large jars with water and pour it all over the offering on, on the wood. Wait a minute, we're supposed to we're supposed to burn this. Yeah, get water, pour it on it. So they did it. He said, you know what? Do it again. Do it again. He said, and they did it again. And then he's like, mm, I really want you to see the power of God. Do it a third time. Do it a third time. He ordered. They did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. This is so powerful, church. I want you to see this. You saw it last week if you were here. He prayed. Turned out, tuned out the 450 people who were there that could kill him at any moment. Who had different opinions in him, different beliefs in him, tuned them all out and said, I, if, if I'm the only one standing, I will be the only one standing. In the name of the Lord, I am going to, I'm going to call on my God. You guys had all day. You, I gave you all day. You bled, you did some weird dancing stuff, you did some, some odd things to call on your God. He was probably sleeping on vacation. I don't know where he was, but he didn't answer. So, can I have a turn? Can I have a turn? And he got into his fortified place, tuned out the 450, and he said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things in your command. Answer me. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are 
God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Stop right here. This is so, so powerful to me. Where you have people caught in the middle. But all of a sudden, what is his prayer for? What is his prayer for? He turns his back, gets into his fortified place, and doesn't pray that God will impress other people. He has a burden for the lost people. And I want to ask you, do you have a burden for other people to be saved? Because there was a time in my life where I shared with someone that I was a Christian, and she stepped back and she said, wait, what? You're a Christian? And I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. And she said, no. No, you're not. I've, I've seen you. I've seen the way you live. You, you're telling me you're a Christian? And I said, yeah. I, I mean, I think I am. My life wasn't showing the light of Jesus. And I had my life so far under a bushel that no one around me knew that I was Christian, that I believed. And do you know what that caused? It caused the burden for other people to be saved to go away. I didn't have a burden. I realized it broke my heart. I didn't have a burden for my friend to know Jesus. I didn't have a burden for my family member to know Jesus. I was just living life. I was saying, okay, one day I'll do this. Other day I'll pray a little bit and I'll go to church on Sunday and I should be good. But listen to his prayer here. He's saying, answer me, Lord, so these people will know that you are Lord. Save them. They had all of this time of cutting themselves and dancing on the altar to a thing that would not answer them or listen to them. And it shut them out. And all it all did was cause a bunch of damage in their life because they were bowing down to something different. Please, God, answer me for that person. Please answer me for this person. Do you ever get in your fortified place and say, I really wish my, my brother was saved. I really wish that my mom knew Jesus. Why? Because when I get to heaven, I want to see her. And I know there are people going to hell. And the Bible says that narrow is the gate. So I know that this isn't an A-lane freeway to get to God. It's not just a love people and you'll get to heaven. It is accept that Jesus did everything that he said he did on the cross. And then look at what he said that we should do and do that and believe in that. And that is how we get to heaven. But do you have a burden for lost people? He had a burden, 450 people who were coming after him. And he prayed for them. And he said, answer me so they will know. Answer me so they will know. Let them know. Let them see you through my faithfulness so they will believe. And then they will start to serve you as King of kings and Lord of lords. Let it be known in this person's life. Let it be known, Lord. Let it be known in their life. I want them to know Jesus. And when I got to that point and the burden came back, I told my wife, I said, I feel such an urgency to share Jesus. And, I, and at first I thought, maybe I'm going to die soon. And it wasn't true. It was just God brought that spark. God brought that fire back into my life for the burden to, uh, for other people to know Jesus. So when we go out, that other people can see the light and they can see who Jesus truly is. So they can see him and they can accept him and they can choose him. They were silent in the first part and they didn't, they didn't make a decision. But I want to ask you, some of you today need to make a decision. You need to choose. And my burden, the, the only reason we moved to this island, the only reason I got into ministry is God told me to, but also because I have a burden for people to know the risen king. That is it. That's it, church. I don't want the fame. I don't want the popularity. I don't want the riches. I want people to know Jesus. And I want the spirit of Elijah to come upon all of us because I feel like as a country, we have become cowardly and soft. 
And if we have the spirit of Elijah to say one against 450, I don't care. But I'm bringing down, I'm, I'm calling down fire from heaven. And before I do that, I'm saying, answer me, Lord. Answer me. I'm pleading to you in my fortified place. Please plant a seed in that person. Please let them know. Because I started setting up idols in my life. I started setting up popularity. I started setting up selfishness. I started setting up partying. And the burden went away. And I didn't see people in heaven or hell anymore. I just saw people. And then I was convicted. And then I repented. And decided if I, even if I stand alone, that burden for the lost people came back. But I want to ask you, does anyone know who you really are? Because the assumption today is that we're, we're Christians and we're believers. You're in here because there's something that the, the Holy Spirit has guided you to a bar with a guy in flip-flops talking about Jesus. We're, we're assum the assumption is that Jesus is in your life. But what if I went over and knocked on your neighbor's door? Would they know that you're a Christian? What if I went to your coworker? And said, tell me a little bit about would they would Jesus be one of the first things? But he's saying, answer me, answer me, answer me, so they will know. They will know. Look at this confidence. Look at this confidence. But do you know why we don't share at times? Do you know why we, we rely on just a guy with a microphone or listening to a podcast? And that's how we get fulfillment. Do you know why we don't share? And I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to raise my hand and tell you why. It's because we think we're going to stumble through it. We don't think, we think we don't have all the answers. What if they ask me the tough questions? What if they ask me about the end times? And, and I don't know. And that turns them away. Can, can, I, can I give you a word of encouragement? If you just open your mouth and start talking about Jesus, he will give you the answers to any question. And those who have lacked confidence in sharing Jesus, I want to prophesy over you today that you can open your mouth and if the only word that comes out is the name of Jesus, that will plant a fire in their soul and their heart that cannot go away. But how will people know you? How do people know you? What's your identity in? I don't, I don't get it right all the time, but I want to fight for it. I do. I want to fight for it. I want people to know that I know Jesus. They can hate me for it or see Christ in me. Their reaction isn't up to me. Their reaction is not up to me. Because some people will hate me because of my title. But, but I want you to know, first and foremost, I am not a pastor. I am a sinner saved by grace and grace alone. That is my identity. That is who I am. And if they never know that I'm a pastor, I don't care. I want them to know that I know Jesus and I love Jesus, that he's my God and I'm his servant. But they, he had no crowd cheering him on, did he? There was no one cheering him on and pushing he alone rebuilt this altar. He alone is the one, only one that obeys the word of God. And when you have a breakthrough, a lot of the time it's because you were alone. We don't like that word, do we? I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone. No one wants to be alone. He was alone as a man, but God was with him. God was with him. When we obey God's words, there's going to be seasons where we're alone. When we're alone and we feel alone. But God says he'll never leave nor forsake us. So he's with us so we're not alone. But we feel alone. It's a lonely place to be a godly person in this world. I want you to know that. It is a lonely place at times to be a godly man in this world. And then I look at Noah. And the Bible said that he preached for decades. And no one followed him. And alone he built the ark. 
I look at Daniel when he was in the lion's den. No one was there saying, let's do this to you. Let's pray together. Let's pray together, Daniel. The reason you're getting thrown in the lion's den is because you were praying to God instead of this false God or to this king. So, you know what? We're with you. We got you back. No one. He was alone except for God with him. Look at Peter walking on the water. There was no one else on that water except for the Lord. And he did it alone. I will stand alone as a person who claims Christ, even if the world tells me to stop. And I don't know if that was my button to stop, but I have just a little bit more. <laughs> but it's weird when you follow God. When I started getting that burden for lost people back, it was weird looking around me. And I would, I would look around and say, man, where'd all my friends go? Where'd all my friends go? Why, why am I not getting the text messages anymore to go to parties? Where are the invitations? But it says, all alone he built the altar to the Lord. And I want you to know, praise God for the fellowship of this church because there are people that will build you up and stand with you. But there are times in your life where true ultimate breakthrough is in your fortified place, just you and God, knowing who Jesus is truly. Just you and Him. Relationship with Him. The Bible says that many, when they get to heaven, many will say, Lord, we did many things in your name. We did this, we did this, we did this, we did this. And He says what? Depart from me, I never knew you. So instead of trying to impress God, why don't you press into who he is? Why don't you get into your fortified place and be with him and get to know him as a God who saved your life? Not a God where we check off a box on Sunday mornings and then move on with our life and we worship other worldly things. And then we think we're okay because on Sunday I did all these things, you know, I tied. I went to church, but all alone. He built it. The prophets had all day. And he's praying, God, answer me because I really want to get this, these people saved. I really want them saved. God, answer me, answer me, answer me. Answer me. What's his motive in this prayer? It, it, is it his reputation? No, because what if God doesn't answer me? I called down fire to a furnace and it didn't work. And the guy asked me to never come back. It wasn't his reputation. It wasn't his ego. It wasn't his fame. No, why? That he's saying that these people will know that you are God. That's what we pray for. We pray for our friend. We pray for our spouse. We pray for our neighbors. But what if these seats were filled because of you people praying for other people to know Jesus? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine you going home and not just the pastor and the leadership team praying for lost people and those to fill the seats, but you individually going home and God putting a name on your mind and you praying over and over and over saying, answer me, Lord, answer me, Lord, please put Jesus into their heart. And all of a sudden this place was full, even more full than it is now because of you guys calling out the name of God and saying, please, please, please answer me. But he doesn't need to dance. Elijah doesn't need to dance. There's not a chance he needs to cut himself. He doesn't need to damage himself. He doesn't need to do any of this. Then what happens? You're like, come on, man. What, what happens? Does the fire come down? There, there it is. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. But listen to this, because this is a moment where you can't argue that this was God and God alone that did this. But not only did it burn up the sacrifice, which was customary, which was what would happen, but it did the wood, melted the stones, and have you ever seen soil burn without something added to it? It burned up the soil, 
And it also, I love this, licked up the water in the trench. So Elijah could say, this was God and this was God alone. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So you have all the people who saw this, all the people of Israel saying, this is the God that saved us from slavery. This is the God that parted the Red Sea. We see it now. And they fell down on their faces. And I'm wondering, when's the last time you just fell down on your face because of the goodness of Jesus? Where you just say, God, this miracle in my life is so amazing and so good. I can't believe that you did this. I'm just going to fall on my face and I'm going to praise you because you are the God who this book says you are. But then here's the warning. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Those, those people who thought that the worldly idol would save them. Don't let anyone get in the way. They seized them. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley to slaughter them. Do you see the urgency in this church? Where we have a choice, we're stuck between two opinions, two beliefs. We can't have one foot and one foot, although it's so hard, isn't it? It's so hard, there's times, and thank God for grace, and I'm over here, and all of a sudden I'm like, you know what, I need to get back over here. But I love this because I don't want you to think that fire doesn't still fall from heaven. You can either run to the judgment of God or you can fall on your face in the repentance of God and who he is. But there was no one left in the middle. Do you notice that? There was no one left. There was no waiver. They hesitated between two things. No one was left. You were either on the side of God or you were dead. That was what, how the story ended. That, 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 that There was no swords. There was no slings. There was no stone. There was no military. There was no magic. And James 5 says that Elijah has a nature like ours. So the very last thing that I want to talk about. If you want to break through, you have to recognize the fire. If you truly want to break through, you have to recognize that God can still do that in people's lives. I want to... I want to be like this. I want, it, I want it to be known in here in this ministry we have in one two. I want the spirit that Elijah had. But let me let me get this out of the way. There, there's nothing more annoying to me than false humility. Okay, let's get that out of the way. Nothing more annoying to me than false humility. Well, oh, I'm just a, I'm just an idiot. I'm a fool. Oh, but God can use me. No, no, I'm not going there. But let me tell you the truth. I am not an intellectual genius by any means. You've heard me preach. I stumble over easy words, irregardlessly. <laughs> Which is not a word, but I love that they use it all the time. Do you know I barely graduated high school? Flunked out of college three different times before finally going back. I don't use all these fancy words, trip over things that I'm trying to say to people. I'm not a famous pastor, and I'm not trying to be. But I'll tell you what I have. I have what Elijah had, and so do you, if you have already called on the name of Jesus. I have access to the fire from heaven. What else do I need? Let me ask you that. What else do I need than access to the fire from heaven? I do believe I can call on the power of God to be used. I can read this. It's, God has given me a gift to be able to read this, and His Holy Spirit helps me read this and, and understand most of it. I have to go back a lot. But it says... There are times where I look at this and I say, God, I don't really understand, but Lord, here I am. 
Here I am. And do you know the greatest gift that you can give God is your availability. I'm available to you, God, to be used in whatever means possible. I don't, I don't know how to play any of this. I don't know how to read the notes. It just looks like a dollar sign, pound sign, with little squigglies above it. I don't know how to read the notes. I do know how to read this, but every day I want to wake up and say, I'm going to lay it on the altar, and God use me. It's what I love about my friend Nate, is every Sunday he comes up and he lays his gift on the altar and says, God, use me. Use me. Use me. Not for popularity. I know Nate. Not for fame. Definitely not for money. We tried to pay him one time and he wouldn't take it. But what he's saying is, God, use me on this morning. And then you can start to come up and play. But I want you to know that this, this scene we have here, it was definitely a show, wasn't it? It was a show of the power of God coming through Elijah's life and changing Israel, where they finally said, I'm going to repent, and I'm got, we're getting rid of the idols, and those who, who serve Baal, who serve the world, were into God's ultimate judgment. But this, is, this church, this ministry, is not here to entertain you. It's not theater. There's a part that we have control over, and that part is, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Use me. I want to give it my all. Then I ask for the fire of God to come down, the power of God to consume us, where people feel it. Where you walk in these rooms, and you're like, in this room, and you're like, I just feel like my soul is at home. I just feel like Jesus is in this room. That he is with us. There's something wild. I've been to many churches, but I just feel like when I walk in this room, I'm consumed by this fire. And I can't explain it, and I can't understand it, but, but there's something else in this room, because I'm going to close with this. It's God's job to control the fire. It's our job to get into the fortified place and call on the fire. And we don't know when the fire will come. I called on fire for a furnace. And the guy kicked me out of his house. And he had a note in my file saying, I don't want that uh, Jesus guy back into my house. One year later, I walk into the office and they said, this is really weird, but since we put in a new unit, one year later we're doing a maintenance check on this guy's unit, and he requested you. And I said, he, he told me he didn't want me. And they said, I, I said, double check. Double check, because in the notes, I, 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 I get, I'm not about to get shot in California of going in someone's house who asked me not to. I'm not about that. I really wish I had it here, but it's somewhere in a box that's kept safe. But I walk into his house, and he said, Furnace is fine. Can I show you something? I said, yeah. Hesitant, and I was like, what am I walking into? He showed me a lot of things. But he brought me this handmade cross that I still have today. And he said, I want you to know that something kept coming up in my life over and over and over in that year since you've been in my house. And I finally relented and gave my life to Jesus. And I wanted to give you this as a gift. Now, church, I share that because of one reason and one reason only. I called down fire to the wrong thing. <laughs> but he saw me calling down fire to something. 
And God used that to put fire into him. And now we have been staying in heaven by one more individual just by being unashamed of who I am in Jesus. So I want you to walk out of these doors and I don't want you to be ashamed. I want you to stand for your beliefs. I don't care what the world or this country is telling you. I want you to be unashamed. I want you to be able to walk into places and then see you and say there's something different about them. They, I had a story with, with someone right before church that said, these people just keep sitting by me and it's the light that's in them. Where does that light come from? It's the fire from God that he's put in you. And so many times we have put a bushel over it saying, no, 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 I'm not going to share because I am too scared. Can I implore and ask you? There are people's lives at stake. There's eternity at stake for you taking off that bushel and shining your light so bright that there is no doubt that Jesus is all around you and in this room and in the world that you live in. But if you take off that bushel and say, I'm just going to follow you, Jesus. I don't care what time the fire comes, but I know that fire will come in one way or the other. And I'm calling it on, and I love it so much, that cross that that man gave me. And he said, because of you being unashamed of your faith, no matter how many times I mocked you, I'm now going to heaven. So church, call down the fire from God. Call it down. Call it down. Your brother, your sister, your mom, your daughter, your son, your, whoever it is that doesn't know Jesus, call down the fire. Call down the fire. And keep saying it over and over and over and over again. It took this guy one year. It took me 29 years. It's not up to us. It's up to him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand before you and we can rebuild the altars that we have in our life. Maybe it's the altars of this world that we have built up that have done nothing. They have spoken nothing to us. They have changed nothing in us. But I ask that we rebuild the altar of the Lord. That we gain perspective on who you are. And that we call down fire. Not, not for us, but for those in our life that we want to see with you. That their name is imprinted in our hearts and our minds and our souls. So every time we pray, it is a prayer for them and you are listening. Unlike these idols, you have ears that hear. You have a mouth that speaks. You have eyes that see. And you are a living, breathing God who gave your life for us. Spilt your blood on that cross. But rose three days later. And you were saying all we have to do is say yes to that. With all eyes closed, I want to give you this opportunity. If you want to come to the altar, if you want to rebuild the altar of your life, if you want to call on the name of Jesus and say, God, I, I, I served these worldly things for too long. I just want you and you alone. I don't have it together. God never said you have, have to have it all together before coming to him. He says, come to me and I will put you back together. And all you have to do is say yes. And I, I truly want to pray for those in this room that want to say yes to that today. If you would just shoot your hand up and put it right back down. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus, you were so, yes. Still going. Yes. God, you were so good. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we could serve at the altar of you. And thank you for shedding your blood, giving your life to save ours while we were still sinners. In Jesus' holy name, amen.